chat. Hello, guys. Welcome to another Guts of World War Two, and not World War Two. Guts and Glory, of the American Revolution. And okay, so Chapter Two: The Shot Heard Round the World, The Battles of Lexington and Concord, Lexington and Concord, Massachusetts, April nineteenth, seventeen seventy-five. By the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag to April's. Freeze unfurled. Here, once the embattled farmers stood and fired the shot heard round the world. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Concord Hymn. Just before midnight on April eighteenth, seventeen seventy-five, the commander of all British forces in North America assembled many of his top officers for a secret meeting. By the flickering yellow light of a wax candle, Governor Thomas Gage. Carefully pointed out locations on a map of colonial Massachusetts, laying out objective for the officers who were huddled around this war room table. Governor Gage was a hardened general in the British Army with over twenty years of experience in the American colony. He had survived wars on three continents, personally fought against broadsword swinging Highlanders in the swamps of Scotland, crossed sabers with ferocious. Al Algonquin warriors in the forests of Quebec, led bayonet assaults against French fortifications in Belgium. This man was a warrior, and when the King of England tasked him with crushing the early rumblings of rebellion in North America, he had a plan to take care of it. Under the cover of darkness, the British Tenth Regiment on foot. Quickly loaded themselves into transport ships and began silently sailing across the Charles River toward Charlestown, Massachusetts. From there, orders were to march eighteen miles to the city of Concord, where Gage believed the Americans were putting together a stockpile of cannons, bullets, and equipment for a possible military uprising. Along the way. A few companies of British soldiers were ordered to stop at the town of Lexington and arrest two men on charges of treason: Boston businessman John Hancock and our pal Samuel Adams from Chapter One. But there was one hitch in their plans: the American patriots had spies everywhere, and they were fantastic at their jobs. As the British ships began making their way across the river. There was a, there was a flicker of movement in the highest tower, the tallest building in Boston. Two ordinary lanterns placed side by side, and inso- innocently lit up the steeple of the old North Church. While most observers might see this and say, "Okay, cool, someone is up there doing a little late night reading," the Sons of Liberty knew better. Lanterns in the tower meant one thing and one thing only: the British are coming. One lantern would be posted if they were coming by land. Two lanterns if they were coming by sea. The patriots ran into action immediately, galloping across the countryside on thundering horses. Boston silversmith Paul Revere and his buddy William Dawes hauled tail to warn the colonists that a huge force of British soldiers were on their way to start smashing stuff. Hurtling through the night, Revere and Dawes stopped out only to start their warnings, kicking into a gear of network of dozens of riders who charged from Vermont to Connecticut with the news. Sam Adams and John Hancock got their gear and made a break and made a break for it. Patriots in Concord began packing up important war materials and either pulled them out of Concord or trying to find good spots in the town to hide them in. And all across the countryside, American Revolutionary fighters, known as Minutemen, threw on their hats and cartridge boxes and grabbed their rifles. They were called Minutemen because they had to be ready, ready to hop out of bed and fight at a minute's notice. Most of the time, they were part of their town's militia, which I mentioned earlier is like a neighborhood watch program where everyone is armed to the teeth with rifles and ready to form an arm at an army at the drop of a hat. This is really important thing for, to have back in time when a raiding party of American Indians or Frenchmen or armed bandits would come running out of the woods at any moment and try to burn your village down. Dawn was breaking on the morning of April nineteenth, seventeen seventy-five. Two hundred fifty members of the British Tenth Regiment of Foot 
lined up in the in battle formation across from the Americans. The detachment's commanding officer, Major John Pitcairn, took one look at the group of gunslinging farmers and was not even a little bit impressed. He was like, Nice try, dudes, and demanded that the colonists lay down their weapons immediately. The king was the law around these parts, and if this sorry little band of himbal hillbilly yokels didn't like it, they would feel the wrath of the most powerful military force the world has ever seen. American militia commander Captain John Parker looked at the imposing red, red wall of hardened British infantry and knew this was a battle he had absolutely no chance of winning. Still, staring down at the British formation, Parker allegedly said to his men, Stand on your ground. Don't fire unless fired upon. But if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. For a moment, it was quiet. It was at this point that a single gunshot rang out across the field like the bell that kicks off a boxing match. Match. It was a shot that would change the course of history forever. Nobody really knows for sure who fired the shot heard round the world, or even which direction the bullet came from. It seems highly unlikely that a British army in rifleman would fire his weapon without receiving order to do so, so my best guess is that it was a colonist who was cranky about the idea of backing down to the redcoats. Honestly, it didn't matter, because total insanity broke out as soon as that bullet was fired. The Minutemen scrambled in the cover behind an old stolen war wall and immediately started firing their muskets. The British commanders ordered volley fire, which is where every dude in the company stands shoulder to shoulder and rips off a bullet the moment they get to order to ready, aim, fire. The Battle of Lexington didn't last long. The British cranked off a few volleys. The minute men tried to return fire, but there was no hope. The Americans fled the field, leaving behind eight men dead and nine more wounded. The British suffered one wounded and lost no one. They searched for Adams, heard he was halfway to Philadelphia, then headed on to meet up with the rest of the 10th Regiment in Concord. As the British troops marched through the countryside, though, they kept hearing the ominous sound of alarm bells. By the time they arrived in Concord, nearly 400 Minutemen were assembled in the hills outside town, silently watching their movements. The Brits stormed into Concord and went to work completing their mission to smash all the cool stuff the Patriots were hiding there. They set fire to wagons, threw a bunch of gunpowder in the lake, threw a bunch of gunpowder into the lake, confiscated bullets, and sent soldiers into homes to search for contraband. In one particular awesome case, an old colonial woman slapped a British major in the face for coming into her home without permission. Then all 2,500 soldiers, they had gained some reinforcements by this point, ate lunch and started their march back to Boston. This is when things really got rough for them, because by this point, the forest surrounding the main road leading from Concord to Boston was almost completely lined with Minuteman snipers waiting to ambush the exhausted redcoats. According to Lieutenant Colonel Francis Smith of the 10th Regiment on a foot, for the next 18 miles, and 18 miles is a long way to walk, there were barely five minutes total in which the redcoats weren't getting shot by colonial troops hiding in the woods along the road. The Brits did what they could to fight back, but they were wearing bright red uniforms, making them really easy targets for colonial marksmen on their home turf. Probably the greatest story from this part of the battle is the tale of Captain Samuel Whitmore. Whitmore was born in England in 1695, and he'd served in the British Army for over 50 years, but he had taken a liking to the colonies and was firmly on the side of American freedom. Whitmore, all alone, with no backup, 
positioned himself across the stone wall, waited in ambush for the British soldiers, and then single-handedly engaged an entire British regiment with nothing more than his musket, a pair of dueling pistols, an old French sword, and the pure liquid anger coursing through his veins. This guy popped up like an old rifle toting jack-in-the-box the moment the British troops were on top of him. He fired his musket at point-blank range, busting the nearest guy so hard it nearly blew his red coat into the next dimension. Then, with a company of Brits bearing down on him, he quick drew a match set of twin flintlock pistols and sent another two red coats down. Then he unsheathed an ornate French sword, He'd captured off an enemy officer during King, King George's War way back in 1748, and this 80-year-old madman stood his ground in hand-to-hand combat against a couple dozen trained soldiers, each of whom was probably a quarter of his age. The hand-to-hand didn't work out so well. Whitmore was shot through the face by a 69 caliber bullet, hit with a rifle, and bayoneted 13 times. The Brits left him for dead and continued their march back to base, harassed the entire way by Whitmore's fellow militiamen. Amazingly, however, Samuel Whitmore didn't die. When his friends rushed out from their homes to check on his body, he found the half-dead, ultra-bloody 80-year-old still trying to reload his weapon. The dude actually survived the war, finally dying in 1793 at 98 from old age and awesomeness. A 2005 act of the Massachusetts legislature declared him an official state hero. And today, there's a really cool historical marker at the spot where he made his stand. All told, about 250 British men were killed or wounded on their day-long death march across the Massachusetts countryside. That night, more American Minutemen mobilized and flocked with the British in Boston. By the following dawn, roughly 15,000 Americans had sur- surrounded the small British force holed up inside the city. The American Revolution had officially begun. I can't think, but it must have been a preconcerted scheme in them to attack the king's troops, the first favorable opportunity that offered. Otherwise, I think they could not... In so short a time, as from our marching out, I have raised such a numerous body, and for so great a space of ground. Lieutenant Colonel Francis Smith, 10th Regiment of Foot, Letter to General Thomas Gage, April 22, 1775. Patriots and Loyalists Many people in the America of 1775 had been born in England, had fought on England's side in wars, or just believe the king and the mother country and didn't want to break away. These people didn't like a bunch of rebels taking over their towns, beating up all the redcoats, and setting up a strange system of government that didn't have any logical order. In the loyalists' minds, that wasn't logical. So, like, in the loyalists' minds, that would that wasn't logical. For these reasons, in the early days of the war, most of the people in the American colonies were either Whigs or Patriots, people who supported rebellion, or Tories or loyalists, people who supported staying with England. Each group accused the other for being traitors, and their arguments turned entire cities against one another. Some of the most brutal cutthroat fighting of the American Revolution occurred not between British and American armies, but between Patriot and Loyalists' military regiments. What are you trying to say? When you read letters that were sent during the time of the revolution, it can be really confusing. If a lowercase letter S appears at the beginning of the middle of a word, it is written as an F. So, for instance, pursuit of happiness becomes pursuit of happy fists. Happy fists. Also, the people capitalized every noun in the sentence, as I am doing in the sentence, which can make it really difficult, like a person, for me to read. The soldiers. The men who fought in the American Revolution came from all walks of life. Some were rich, some were poor. Many were young, others were old. They were husbands, fathers, sons, and brothers, all with families waiting for them back home if they were one of the lucky few to make it through the struggle. 
War is a bloody, terrible thing that pulls families apart and pushes people to the absolute limit of what a human being can take. So let's talk a bit about what these guys might have been like. The American soldier. Many of the rebels were using guns they'd brought from home. These could be old shotguns, hunting rifles, captured British rifles, or other weapons that were sometimes outdated. Many carried a weapon called a Pennsylvania rifle, a long barrel with muzzle-loading flintlock. It had grooves in the back barrel that were designed to spin the bullet, like a kind of how you throw a football in a spiral to make it go straighter and not wobble all over the place. These rifles were excellent for hunting, as they had a great range and were very accurate, but they took a long time to load, and they couldn't mount a bayonet. The American rebels were dressed in their regular everyday clothes, typically a three-cornered hat, a long, a long wool, a tip of, mm, the American rebels were dressed in their regular everyday clothes, typically a three-cornered hat, a long wool coat that hung down to about their knees, a cotton shirt, knee-length breeches, tall white knee socks, and black shoes with big buckles on them. The style of the day was long hair, usually pulled back into a ponytail, and most men shaved their face regularly. Later in the war, they started importing blue uniforms from France, and they were equipped with a French infantry musket, a big, heavy, inaccurate 69 caliber gun known as a Charleville. Or Charleville. The Americans were typically English colonists, though there were many others of German, Dutch, Polish, Irish, Scottish, and other descent as well. Most of them were wilderness people, used to hunting and shooting in the woods for food or furs, and they could draw detailed maps of the land from memory. Although most settlers had come familiarity, while fighting against American Indian raids, they had little experience in organized warfare. But they were tough people, hardened by a difficult frontier lifestyle that inspired their cause. In most cities, they were fighting in their own backyards, defending their homes and their country in a struggle of freedom. The British soldier. The the average British soldier was between 20 and 45 years old, and soldiers were required to stand at least 5 feet 7 inches tall enlisted troops dressed in their scarlet coats typically came from poor families in Scotland, Wales, England, and Ireland. Their officers typically came from the aristocratic class because back in those days it was possible to pay money to the army to become an officer. So if your dad was rich, you could fork over some gold and enlist in the army as a lieutenant or something, even if you had no idea what the heck you were doing. It's like buying premium DLC in Call of Duty. It's estimated that about 60% of the British officers in the war bought their rank. A lot of these guys wore those fake white powdered wigs because they thought that white hair made them look older and more distinguished and thus more likely to get promoted. British soldiers carried about 60 pounds of gear, from backpacks and food to ammunition pouches and musket cartridges. They were armed with a brown vest, a large smooth bore 71 caliber musket that was much heavier and less accurate than the Pennsylvania rifle, but it fired a huge destructive musket ball. One mega advantage for this troop, for these troops was that every British soldier carried a bayonet, a foot-long pointy metal spike that fitted off the end of his rifle and turned it into a gigantic spear. And all soldiers were trained in how to fight in formation with one of those suckers. Since guns in those days took 30 to 40 seconds to reload, the British would march in formation until they were about 50 yards away from the enemy, fire two or three volleys, and then just run in and start stabbing everything. As I said earlier, the American's Pennsylvania rifle couldn't hold a bayonet, and there were not many bayonets available to the Americans anyway, so in hand-to-hand combat the British had a massive advantage. The saying was that the British could would 
pray for rain. Before a battle with the, with the colonials, because muskets at this time wouldn't fire if their gunpowder got too wet. So any fight in a rainstorm was usually decided with the bayonet rather than with gunfire. After a few encounters, the Americans quickly came to fear British bayonets almost as much as they feared British cannons. Know your founding fathers. Name: John Hancock. Birthday: January twenty third, seventeen thirty seven. Birthplace: Braintree, Massachusetts. Claim to fame: has the biggest signature on the Declaration of Independence. Job before the war: merchant ship owner and politician. Role in the war: president of the Second Continental Congress. After the war. Governor of Massachusetts from seventeen eighty to seventeen eighty five, and from seventeen eighty seven to seventeen ninety three. Bonus fact: Hancock's dad was a minister, but he died when John was just seven years old, so John was adopted and raised by his uncle and aunt.